In some respects, there are few stories more familiar to Catholics than the Christmas story, the story of Jesus' birth at a manger in Bethlehem. And yet, that very familiarity can lead us to miss important details and truths about what happened on that first Christmas long ago. Join us today as we revisit that night in Bethlehem with Dr. Scott Hahn, professor of theology at Franciscan University and author of the new book, Joy to the World, How Christ's Coming Changed Everything and Still Does. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And we're joined here in our studios here with uh, our regular panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, an excellent professor uh, here at the University in Systematic Theology. Who said so? <laughs> <laughs> and a uh, guest panelist today, uh, Father Sean Sheridan, the president and also a professor at Franciscan University. And uh, no stranger to us, Dr. Scott Hahn. Uh, Scott holds the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization here at Franciscan University. You've been here 25 years, and you're also the founder and president of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. Right. Um, you've written over 40 books, and the book we want to talk about today is very timely, uh, Joy to the World, How Christ's Coming Changed Everything and Still Does. Mm. Thanks, Scott, for being here. Great to be back with you, Mike. And uh, this, is, this is actually a very, obviously, a very important topic for us in the, the church as a whole, the incarnation. But we as Americans, and maybe all of us, um, you know, in the stores, we get very confused because, you know, before the leaves are falling from the trees, the Christmas trees are in the stores, and Halloween might, decorations might be up also with Christmas decorations. We get very confused in our society about these seasons. Right. So unpack a little bit for us Advent and Christmas. Well, I think we've got two competing calendars, as it were, <laughs> you know, and we've got two competing sets of traditions because Christmas for many people really begins on Black Thursday, the yes. day after Thanksgiving right. when all the stores open early and all the sales yeah. begin. And that's really what it's all about. It's about generating economic prosperity. Isn't that when Christmas starts? That sort of I thing. That's yeah. <laughs> but for us as Catholics and Christians in general, uh, the liturgical calendar begins not with January 1st, but the first Sunday in Advent. Mm. And you have four consecutive Advent Sundays that prepare for and lead up to Christmas. And so we can see that Advent is to Christmas sort of what Lent is to Easter. It's a time of preparation. But it's also a penitential season, you know, not to kind of take our depression a little deeper and make it darker, but to harness that sort of natural tendency, you know, at the end of the year to prepare for the joy that comes to the world that is simply out of this world, and that is the light of Christ, who shines in Christmas like he shines in the Paschal mystery with Easter Sunday and the resurrection. These are not two competing liturgical seasons. They're sort of you know, mutually reinforcing. One is ordered to the other and vice versa. But I think the more we discover what Advent is as a penitential season, you know, the more we can really enter into the joy of Advent and even the greater joy of Christmas. And this is something that goes back for me 30 years because I didn't really distinguish between Advent and Christmas. I knew there was some distinction, but in the Protestant tradition it was largely overlooked or lost. And so in becoming a Catholic and then four years after I did, Kimberly did, gradually, you know, and not without some tension because we just wanted to put up the tree and put up the lights and all of the rest. And, you know, in a Catholic community like Steubenville, we're like, Wait, Advent? Yeah. Penance? <laughs> What's that? You know? right. And as we gradually grew into this, we discovered so much more joy, not right. only at Christmas, and as we extend that too, but as also in, in Advent. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that's important for us to realize that this is a season. That, that the church is saying, let's stop. Let's, sure. let's begin again, right? I mean, I, I think that it's, that's not insignificant that we say that the liturgical year begins in Advent, right. that we begin with a waiting, uh, the night before the dawn, right? And, yeah. uh, There's a sense in which we're almost like recapitulating salvation, salvation history because mm. when you look at the Old Testament, it's like a story in search of an ending. The people of God are in exile in yeah. darkness, awaiting the light of the world that dawns not only for the Jews, but for all of the nations as well. And so the songs that we sing, Advent hymns, 
and the readings that we hear in the Advent Sunday scripture readings. You know, all of this is sort of like making deep sense out of the, the four weeks that we pass through, which were more like four centuries for the people of God. You right, know? Right. I, I like that note of continuity, uh, Scott, that you stress between the old and the new. Mm. And I think uh, it's reproduced uh, when we come to the two calendars, which really ought not to be two competing affairs, but rather complementary. Right. Uh, the solar year is really permeated by the liturgical year, just yeah. as grace enters nature, completes it, perfects it. As the poet Hopkins puts it, it rides nature like a river. It doesn't just hover above the flux, but it enters deep down uh, into the dearest freshness, deep yeah. down things, and transforms everything. Uh, I once had a professor who said, once the incarnation happened, everything and everyone changes. Right. Nothing remains the same. But it's not as if the old had been obliterated. Uh, it is somehow made new. It's repristinated. Mm. And that's what Christmas represents. That's so true. Right. I love how the church really gives us that opportunity during Advent to reflect and prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Uh, leading through that whole liturgical season, starting with the, the stories of John the Baptist calling the people out in the desert to prepare the way of the Lord. But then even more particularly preparing, uh, and as we hear the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, oh, yeah. Mary and Joseph, those people who waited for so many years representing their fellow Jews for the coming of the Messiah. Right. And the, the real experiences that they had in their own personal lives of this coming of the Messiah and how it impacted them and potentially change their lives, certainly, and changes the lives of each and every one of us. Yeah. I, I just love reflecting on those stories and then thinking of how, you know, what would I have done in those circumstances? Would I have been as bold to accept the invitations that they did right. to be able yeah. to welcome the Messiah the way they did? You know, I think we tend to overlook the crisis of faith that had descended upon the people of Israel for over four centuries. I mean, yeah. you have the covenant of David establishing the kingdom of David with the son of David, and it ends up being the longest dynasty in recorded human history, over 400 years of unbroken succession. But 400 years is not the same as God promising it will be forever, mm -hmm. an everlasting kingdom. So when the Babylonians descended upon Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and destroyed the monarchy, yeah. you know, for the next several centuries, the people of God are looking around wondering, what has God allowed to happen, you know? Well, the earthly king and that earthly line was always and only a sort of sign that pointed to an eternal son who, you know, who would become the son of David to reveal the grace of what it means to be children of God. But that period of time, you know, when you mention Zechariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, I mean, they embody that faithful remnant that somehow held on to faith and hope and love. Yeah. And, and when you think about how, um, how quickly we jump to Christmas missing Advent, right. I think we do naturally then T take that for granted, miss some of those cues that, that, that the liturgical calendar, that the, the readings and, and what the church is asking of us, we miss out on that and therefore we miss out on some of the joy of, of Christmas. Mm -hmm. We want joy but we want it now <laughs> on our terms. <laughs> That's right. our you know, food. Ev every, <laughs> everything we're saying is so reflective, I think, of, of the constants in the human condition. Man is made for promise, mm -hmm. expectation. It's written right into the scaffolding of his being. Right. Nothing is more beautiful than to begin. Yeah. And really the beginning is not Advent, it's the Feast of the Annunciation. Mm -hmm. That's when incarnation happens. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Hopkins, of infinity dwindled to infancy. I mean, this adorable child is the Lord of the universe inserted into this finite space. And it is, I, I think, uh, helpful to genuflect when the creed is recited on the Feast of the Annunciation and, and then once Christmas more, too. nine months later, mm -hmm. on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. Those nine months are sacred. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's when time enters eternity, is lifted up and placed on the plane of, of divinity. That's As so the true. fathers would say, this young, pure, virgin teenager, you know, contains the uncontainable. 
Right. You know, yeah. And brings it to all of us. This is not a singular prerogative that she hoards for herself, but she right. rather lavishes right. upon all of us as her children, yeah. too. I mean, he, he so identifies with us that he becomes a zygote, yeah. 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 an embryo, a fetus, a, yeah. a child. Yeah. And at the end of the day, a corpse, the whole human condition yeah. is somehow encompassed by the word. So, so let's, let's unpack a little bit in the beginning. Um, Matthew begins with a genealogy, a listing of, of names, of the father of this, the, the son of, you know, going through this whole line. Um, it, it seems for many who are reading it, why, why don't we just get right to the, the meat of the story? Why do we have to go through this whole uh, listing of names? Why yeah. is that important? Why does this, why is the, the Holy Spirit right. put that in uh, Matthew? Well, style? first of all, what you're pointing out is that we've got four Gospels and not just one. Right. And they all contribute in a way that is not contradictory, but truly complementary. Right. You know, we only have infancy narratives in two Gospels, yes. and that is Matthew and Luke. Mark just begins with John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness. John, of course, begins with the eternal generation of the Son of God, right. whereas we have the human generation of the Son of, of Mary, as it were, in Matthew and Luke. And, you know, as you look at this, you know, it's sort of like a child who hears the music you know, of a, of a symphony. And you can't distinguish between the woodwinds and the string and the brass and the percussion until you get older. And then as you get older, you realize this is not a diversity that threatens unity. It enhances and deepens yeah. it, you know. So the, the testimony of the four evangelists, and especially the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, give to us a richness that is not to be lost. Mm. And it enhances that vision of faith that we have you know, going back to when we were children, but then all of a sudden the symphony of Scripture just sun, you know, comes alive. Hmm. But you're right, Matthew was probably written originally for Jewish Christians, okay. for people in Palestine and perhaps Syria as well. And so the opening is this genealogy of three fourteens. You've got 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 more from David to the exile, and then 14 from the exile to Joseph and Mary. And, you know, any Jewish Christian reader who knows his Hebrew would instantly recognize three fourteens, aha, this is the Davidic pedigree, this is right. the royal genealogy, because yeah. when you see David's name in Hebrew, it only consists of three letters, mm -hmm. but the numerical values assigned to those three letters add up to 14. So it's sort of like a, a double whammy. You, yeah. you really get it not only in terms of the list, but in terms of the symbolism as well. Right. You know, in contrast, you have Luke giving us a genealogy that goes all the way back to Adam. Right. It's 77, not 42. But just to focus for a minute more on yeah. Matthew's genealogy, you know, we tend to read Matthew's Gospel and wonder, why didn't an editor press the delete key? Right. You don't yeah, begin yeah, yeah, with yeah, a yeah. genealogy, you know. Right. But when we put ourselves back in the first century, we realize the Jews would have been reading this in a breathless excitement. Yes. You mean the Davidic line wasn't lost when that Babylonian destroyed all of the sons of the king and then drove out his eyes and took the king into slavery? Because that was the end of the line from an right. empirical political standpoint. But the faithful in that line of David kept track, even if they weren't mm. publishing the genealogy. Yeah, right. Matthew does, and suddenly you realize that God has been faithfully fathering his family through the ages, mm -hmm. right. whether the, the temple records had it or not. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, and that's a beautiful way to set everything up, and in the context of family then, too. Right? Mm -hmm. It's both a royal family, but it's, it's family. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, as I, I, I try to point this out in the book, that the hero of the story is not just simply Jesus, because, you know, as actors go, he doesn't do very much. Right, you know? right, right, right. But the, the hero of the story in this case, I think, really is the family, the holy family, an earthly image of the divine family, the holy trinity. And as we see the story unfolding, whether it's in Matthew's account or in Luke's account, you can see that, that God doesn't just enter human history. He enters the drama of, of human life right. with a mother and a father and swaddling clothes and all of the other elements of the story. But it also reminds us that we ought to appropriate this story in our families too mm -hmm. and allow it to permeate right. us with yeah. that joy. Sure. It, it is encouraging that when God comes, He doesn't come alone. <laughs> he is the fixed sun, but He has all kinds of satellites, constellations that move rhythmically about uh, this still point. And, and in a way that testifies to the fact that He enters fully mm -hmm. into a human condition, mm -hmm. into a time and place. What could be more concrete than those genealogies? That's I mean, so true. I mean, it's a monotonous kind of recitation, but it does, it does infallibly uh, establish that here is a guy who springs forth from a people, a body, a body of this world, 
history. He's not an abstraction. That's He's right. not some force of nature or some spirit that just fell out of the heavens. He's a real human being right. with antecedents. And he's, he's a not, Jew. He's not just the son of the highest ranking Roman senator either. Right. There, yeah, there's yeah. something that would be almost like nothing, yeah. you know, for people who are looking for the headlines to, yeah. to report this sort of breakthrough. Yeah. And yet the breakthrough isn't shallower as a result. It's much deeper right. than mere politics or, you know, right. celebrities. Is there anything with the significance of him being born in Bethlehem? Is there, what's associated with that? <laughs> I mean, got, I'm just saying. You've got 30 he's, the, <laughs> he's the son of David coming for, to restore the kingdom of David, and so he's got the same birthplace as David. Yeah. And that's what the prophet Micah foresaw, and that's what all of the priests were aware of, and that's why they told Herod whether they should have or not is that's another right, question. That's right. So, and yeah. the house of bread and, and so right. many other great, great Yeah, analogies. Bethlehem means the house of bread in Hebrew. Right. Yes, right. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, stay with us for the next segment of Franciscan University Presents. During Advent, my friends and family and I sometimes like to kind of treat it almost like Lent, where we use it as a time of sacrifice. Rather than focusing on the gift giving and the gift receiving, um, we choose something to sacrifice and offer it up for the Lord so that we can prepare our hearts to receive Him on Christmas. Advent is so important because this is when Jesus takes on two natures. He has the human nature now and the divine nature from being part of the Trinity. And now we have the opportunity to perfect ourselves, to become like Christ so we can participate in that nature and become one with God. People recognize Franciscan University as being academically excellent and passionately Catholic. We have the unique opportunity through our faculty members, through our students, to proclaim that academic excellence by reaching out in many different ways. We also remain passionately Catholic in the way in which we are able to worship, the way in which we are able to bring that love of Christ to others on a daily basis. It's important for us to be able to embrace both. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking about the incarnation and the joy uh, that, that we have during this special season. Um, Scott, you kind of alluded to this, but as we look at the story, as a story, uh, the Christmas story, who is the star? Who's the main actor? Who's the, the, the centerpiece? And obviously, Christ is, is right. in prominence there. But it's, I mean, that's the obvious answer right. to the question. Jesus is the hero, and yet he doesn't act like a typical hero because, in fact, He's hardly acting at all in the story. Right. I mean, he's there in swaddling claws, but somebody else did the swaddling, you know. Right. Uh, he's being nursed, he's being taken to Egypt, and so you step back and you get perspective, and I think immediately you can see that here's an unconventional hero. It's not a warrior, it's not a politician, it's a family. Yes. It's the holy family. And mm. I think when we see that, we can see how it is that the family is the key to Christmas. Yes. And not just in some theoretical sense, you know, but in a very practical and concrete way, the Holy Family is the context in which God's salvation comes to us. I think we tend to think of the family as sort of the stage in which the drama unfolds, but it's the drama itself. Yes, yes. And so to see the struggle of the Blessed Virgin Mary, to hear the Annunciation of the, of the angel Gabriel, to, to recognize that St. Joseph himself had a lot to work through with the help of the Holy Spirit, but he did so as a husband. He did it as a father. She did it as a wife and a mother. Mm. Jesus does it as a child, but it shows that the greatness of God doesn't consist in this capacity to dominate his creatures or to coerce them to have his way, but to display this power through humility, yeah. strength through weakness. Right. And not just at the cross, but as the story begins, you recognize, again, that it's not a Roman Senate. It's not, you know, the, the Egyptians. It's it's this, you know, backwaters of yeah. Palestine, up yeah. in Galilee and then down in Bethlehem. And I think the more we go back and revisit these stories that we think we know so well, mm -hmm. the more we're going to recognize that the backstory is really like the story itself. Yeah. And that there's a drama there that instantly connects with the fact that we're struggling in our families as we go through Advent every <laughs> year. This is so true. You know, I, there is no end of instruction, I, I think, uh, concerning that fact, that datum. Things happen to Jesus. He is heroic, but not in any sort of active uh, Donald Trump sort of way. 
Uh, he's not striding the stage like a colossus. There's a passivity. But in a way, that bespeaks the human condition, yeah, the predicament right. of being powerless. Things happen to us, and we're sort of helpless to prevent them. And Jesus enters into that state of impotence in order to redeem it from below. That makes, I think, his redemption all the more impressive. Yeah, and when you think about that, that's what we all share in common. We all have a mother and a father. That's Whether right. or not um, we know them even or, or have good relations with them, our, the human condition is the family. Right. And, and, and by using the genealogy, by, by making the, the main characters, the star, if you will, of the story, the family, it makes it imminently relatable, and then realizing that Christ was so humble to just yeah. make himself this helpless child. That's yeah, just yeah. beautiful. Especially these days as we're, we're recognizing the challenges that are, uh, the family is uh, uh, faced with these days, we need to really reflect upon how we can look to the model of the Holy Family uh, as yeah. the representation of the, uh, the Holy Trinity itself, uh, leading us and guiding us in renewing family life uh, in the church. I mean, there are those sociological studies that are out there that say, as the family goes, so does the faith. Right. And we need yeah. to be able right. to renew and emphasize yeah. the importance of family, the importance of all members of the family, so that we can then continue to build up yeah. the life of the you, church. You know, what you were just saying, I mean, w that builds on what Regis says in a way that's significant for us, I think, practically too, because the, uh, the people who are actors, the ones who are really acting, are like Herod, you know? Yeah. He's the one who's taking a yeah. lot of initiative. The you villain, know? if you will, yeah. in the story. and the chief priests as well, as the soldiers who come to slaughter the innocents. They're the ones who are really active, you know, That's whereas right. Jesus and Mary and Joseph are sort of passive and responsive, you know? And I, I think as we enter into Advent and Christmas, we're hearing voices all around, don't just sit there, do something. Yeah. And I think the scripture is saying, don't just do something, sit there. Yeah. You know, receive with a sort of passive mm -hmm. but hope-filled faith, yes. a gift that you couldn't possibly concoct on your own, yeah. produce much less sell, you yeah. know? And I think that is sort of why it is that, you know, the prayerful receptivity of Christmas comes through weeks of Advent preparation. Mm, yeah. Mm. yeah, that's it, powerful. I mean, you, you can't overplay the importance of family. That's mm -hmm. the centerpiece. Uh, Robert Frost has a great line. Home, he says, is the place where when you go there, they have to take you yeah. in. <laughs> but there's a sense in which we don't have to take him in. Mm -hmm. uh, we can refuse him. Right. Mary could have uh, declined to give her assent, her That's fiat, right. but they welcome him. Yeah. Joseph yeah. and Mary, they allow him to enter into their world and he transforms it. Yeah. yeah, that's the heroic action, is that reception. Yes. You know, whereas the anti-heroes are all of the leaders, the politicians, you know, the people who would have been splashed on the headlines of the next that's day's right. paper, you know. Yeah. Right, right. Right. And then you look at that there was no room for him in the end. Right. I mean, you think about all that that went into, he was on the passive side. Even the Holy Family was, was somewhat reactive to and meditating on and just accepting right. uh, what was coming. Well, well Scott, there. you have a beautiful line, I think, in an interview that you did uh, after the book was published. Uh, uh, you, you were talking about the challenge that Christ uh, presents, uh, but that the tendency is to hang that sign, no vacancy, yeah. uh, on, yeah. on Bethlehem, as if to say, look, we don't want you. You mess up our lives. Mm -hmm. You interfere with our stuff. You're inconvenient. Uh, you came at an hour in a place that really didn't want you. And Bethlehem, Nazareth, these are no account places. Jerkwater towns, nobody's heard about these places. What are you doing, God? Why did you enter the world in the first place? It's particularly striking to me as we're talking about Jesus not being welcomed in the way in which he was brought into the world. But yet Jesus himself is the very uh, icon of being welcoming That's and right. welcoming us back into relationship with him. I mean, think about this year, we're celebrating the year of mercy, which Pope Francis has just started a few weeks ago and encouraging all of us to go back and participate in the sacrament of reconciliation so that we can share right. the joy of being sons and daughters yeah. of the Father yeah. and be being welcomed back into that relationship. Not that we're gonna be rejected, 
but that we are going to be welcomed and we are right. going to be loved mm -hmm. and we are going to be able to approach that little child right. in the manger. I, I, there's a Jewish proverb Christmas. that says, if God were to become man and live in our world, we would probably throw stones at his windows. Uh, and in fact, we've done a lot more than that. I mean, sure. we slowly tortured him to death mm -hmm. and yet he is the very essence mm -hmm. of welcome. Yes. Uh, yeah. He invites this. Yeah, and when we reflect upon, you know, what God did and ask ourselves why he did it, we have to recognize that he didn't get anything out of it. Right. You yeah, know, yeah. it isn't like he had most glory and then he did this in order to get the rest, you know. Right. Uh, at the end of the story, he doesn't end up getting more glory than he already had. So why go through all yeah, of this? Why knock mm -hmm. himself out? Yeah, and, and clearly yeah. the only answer to that question that satisfies is he didn't do it to get more glory, but to give his glory right. and not right. a small portion. But the sum total, sure. you know, you see the Blessed Virgin and she is filled with grace as yeah. the angel beholds her. Mm -hmm. right. And as a result, you can see that this is what God wants to lavish upon all of us, mm -hmm. not just because, you know, he is a, a beneficent ruler, but because he is a loving father who longs to lavish yeah. all right. of these good and, things. And, and he invites us, I think, in our own paltry, modest way to make a kind of reciprocal gesture. Right. You know, Jesus says, look, I empty myself, I give everything, mm -hmm. I lavish out my life life, and in return, could you just give me yourself? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all I yeah. want. So when, when we look at this from, uh, Regis talked about how it kind of began at the Annunciation. Yeah. You know, as we, we look at from a historical standpoint at Mary, and but, but who is this woman? The woman who brought Christ to the world, who brought this joy, the well, cause I, of our joy. <laughs> I think we have to recognize that the Blessed Virgin Mary comes in the line of David. But at the same time, it helps us to remember that this is not fable, folklore, or myth, hmm. that there is something profoundly historical about this. You know, when Pope Benedict, our emeritus pope, wrote that trilogy of Jesus of Nazareth, the third and final volume was on the infancy narratives. And not only as pope and pastor, but as a scholar and a professor, he points out that the evidence points not to folklore or myth the way some people made it seem at the end of the, the 20th century. No, all of the evidence shifts back to recognize that this is history, not history as you'd read it on the headlines, but history as we can see salvation history unfolding in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Solomon. And so the Blessed Virgin Mary is especially showcased in Luke's Gospel. Right. There we see not only the Annunciation, but we also recognize in Luke 2.19 that she pondered these things in her heart. Right. And then again in verse 51. And, and you have to wonder, why, why does Luke say that? I mean, how presumptuous to, yeah. to, but the only way Luke could have written that, the only way he could have known it, is if he had interacted with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the echoes of which we find in patristic testimony through the first centuries. And so, I think when we read these, we recognize we're not just getting accurate history, you know, from the perspective of professional reporters. We're getting the heart of history mm. from within the Holy Family, mm -hmm. from the heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then in Matthew's Gospel, I think we also recognize that St. Joseph's perspective is sort of showcased there, mm. you know, especially when we hear that he was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Well, found by whom? Right. Not the Holy Spirit, you know. Yeah, yeah. But when the angel appears to Joseph and says, son of David, you know, it's like, well, no, technically it's not, you know, that's not his father's name, but that is his royal pedigree. Right. So that is his dignity. And then when the angel tells Joseph not to be afraid, he, you know, the angel doesn't say, don't be suspicious. You right, know? Right. Don't be so cynical. You know, Joseph was not suspicious of this virtuous woman. I think the, the, the better way to explain this, as John Paul does, as St. Thomas Aquinas do, and as I try to do, <laughs> you know, is not the suspicion theory, but the reverence theory. Yeah. Don't be afraid to take her. You know, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit by Joseph. Right. And so the very language that Matthew gives us, you know, illuminates what is going on in Joseph's heart. Like, I am not worthy to have you under my roof. Yeah. I'm not worthy to have you as my bride. Right. But if the angel declares me to be the son of David, then in spite of my weakness and smallness, but because of God's grace, I will say yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's powerful, thinking about Mary, thinking about Joseph and right. their reactions and their responses oh. to the invitation, right. yeah. which should, we should be echoing. You, you know, know. What's, what's really remarkable is that we're having a conversation, not about ideas that may have been circulating for a couple mm. of millennia. We're talking about facts, mm -hmm. events mm -hmm. happening right. in the great sea of history. And the only question that's relevant is, did it happen? Mm -hmm. Did it take place? We're talking about uh, 
the ineradicable positivity, as, as Ratzinger puts it. And, and Christianity is, isn't reducible uh, to some idea, a supposition, some mental conceit or construct. It's reducible to an event. And if it happened, and if that's what happened, then it surely is possible to encounter that event, which we do every day in the church, yes. his bride, who continues, as Mary might, uh, to hear the word and to give birth to the Son of God. But look at the significance of how Mary was transformed through that encounter, through that event that occurred in her life. The first phrase that she says when the angel invites her to be the, the mother of God, how can this be? Yeah. The last thing we hear her saying in the Gospels is at the wedding feast of Cana, do whatever he tells you. Yeah. Going from fear to complete trust. Yeah. Through that encounter, through that event that occurred in history. Yeah, she's marvelously confident that That's this right. guy is going to do exactly what she would like him to yeah. do. Yeah. And you know, there's something similar about the angelic annunciation to Zechariah in Luke 1, and then the angelic right. annunciation to the Blessed Virgin. And the responses sound very similar, but Zechariah says, how can I know? And he's rendered <laughs> yeah. dumb and yeah. silent. Right. She says, how can this be? That's awe and wonder. Mm -hmm. She's not right. doubting. She doesn't need yeah. proof. She just wants to know how that's possible. Right. Right. And that's exactly what our Lord leads in. So it's concrete fact, it's concrete history, but it's concrete emotion as well. Mm -hmm. I mean. And so as we go through Advent and Christmas and we go through the whole range of turbulent emotions, you know, we recognize that God doesn't say, oh, come on, that's beneath my dignity. That's right. That is His dignity. Yes. He enters into the feelings and not just the joy, but also the sorrow. Our Lady of Sorrows is Our Lady of Joy. She's the cause of our joy, right. not in spite of the sorrows, but precisely because of them. Yeah, and, and, and realizing that in our struggles, in our families, and all the things that we go through, that's the Holy Family. Yeah. You know, we're experiencing it along with, with Christ. Well, the one human being whom Jesus most uh, visibly, uh, graphically resembles is this woman. Mm -hmm. yeah. She can look at him and say, this is my body. Mm -hmm. This is an extension of myself. He and I have the same color of eyes. Mm -hmm. We're Semites, Jews. Mm -hmm. So for all eternity, the second person is a Jew. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. Beautiful. Stay with us for the next segment of Franciscan University Presents. Mary's virginity is important to the incarnation and the fact that because she had never had relations with a man, she was the mother of God, that there, the child could only be the son of God. Also, it shows that she was the spouse of the Spirit because she had saved herself for God. So the incarnation, for me, has a huge place uh, in my spirituality, in my heart, um, because that moment when Jesus took on human flesh and wedded heaven and earth together, um, in that moment, he once and for all gave a supernatural uh, value to every single thing in our temporal world, um, from doing the dishes all the way to missionary work and everything in between. I am a communication arts major, the president of Film Club, and an editor for Franciscan University Presents. It's really great to be able to work on Franciscan University Presents because it is a national television show on EWTN, and in a lot of other schools you're not going to have that kind of ability to put that on a resume. When I graduate, I know that I'm going to, to be firm in sticking with my faith and you know going to daily mass and a frequent confession and things like that. Because instead of just learning with my mind or just focusing on schoolwork, I, I actually you know can grow with my whole person. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. This entire program springs forth from the very heart of Franciscan University and our mission. Um, right now we're recording in the communication arts studio here at Franciscan University. Uh, the camera and equipment are being operated by our students. Um, our regular panelists here are also professors here at Franciscan University. And today we've been talking about joy to the world, how Christ's coming changed everything and still does. Um, Scott, again, thank you for this great book and great time for us to go deeper as a, as a people into Advent and to really unpack more the mystery. Sometimes we take it too much for granted. Oh, yeah. Um, somebody who shows up in a couple different places throughout the story are the angels. Um, they, they, they appear to Our Lady at the Annunciation. Uh, they, they, they appear to Joseph. They appear to the shepherds. You know, the angels are very present. So, so who are the angels, and, and what are the, what's their purpose? Well, the angels are pure spirits, and so they're wholly different than we are at one level, and yet, like we 
they're called to share a grace that exceeds even their natural excellence. They're called to become children of God, and so they're called sons of God in the Old Testament. Hmm. But they're also ministering spirits that are meant to lead us to salvation, as we read in Hebrews. And so, from the very dawn of salvation history until the dawn of the New Covenant, you can see that they don't have a secondary role. They're practically there at every point in salvation history, and especially concentrated here in the fullness of time when God sends His Son to be born of woman, as Paul says in Galatians 4. And so it shouldn't surprise us that angels really have a prominent role with regard to the shepherds and with right. regard to Joseph and regard to Mary. It would be somewhat stunning if they didn't because right. of their role in much lesser events in the past. But in addition to the angels, you also have the magi, you have the shepherds yeah. and you know, blah, blah, blah. We've heard that all of our lives. <laughs> and it and just yet, fades into the background too quickly. That's right. But the magi themselves are significant because these people, you know, these, these men come from the east, which is probably modern Iraq or Babylon, right. you know, and they're following a star. But, you know, th the idea of magi, you know, wise men is how we translate it. But when you go back, you know, the Jews were suspicious of magi because they were in fact sorcerers. I mean, yeah. they were doing things that were quite contrary to the religion of Israel, and yet here are magi who are submitting not only their, their, their wisdom to the one who is God, but coming to worship the child who is the Son of God. Mm. The gold, the frankincense and myrrh, all of this has symbolism yeah. that, is, that is deep, you know, in terms of priest, prophet, and king, humanity and divinity and that sort of thing. But more to the point, I think, you know, the Magi are sort of like the least likely candidates for God to reveal Himself to yes. because, you know, there was a famous rabbinic saying that if anybody learns anything from the Magi, let him be accursed hmm. because that's just not where you go and yet that's where God goes to bring those who are the most needy of all. And so you'd expect maybe the chief priests and the Levites and the scribes to all have a central role in welcoming the Savior, right. but in fact their role is somewhat ambivalent. Yeah. The least likely are the ones that God so often chooses to kind of humble the proud, you know. Mm -hmm. That's true for the shepherds, shepherds as, well. as well. You know, right. the, right. the shepherds were usually seen as sort of unreliable characters. Right. They Lower were unreliable. Class, yeah. yeah. In fact, there's rabbinic testimony that shepherds weren't allowed to give, they weren't allowed to bear witness in a courtroom because mm. they were deemed to be so unreliable. And yet here they are bearing witness to the King of Glory's yeah. entrance into the world. So the, and so the light of the world went to those dark places. Mm -hmm. That's and, right. And, and, and his message wasn't just for a small people uh, in, in the Holy Land, in Israel. That's right. It was meant for the whole world. But if you, li you know, if you lived in Jerusalem or even more in Bethlehem, you looked down the street and you saw this inn, this stable, whatever, you know, and the Magi are showing up and the shepherds too, you know, it's like, you know, if a child is born and then suddenly people from the underworld show up or, you know, the lower class, you're wondering what kind of neighbors do we have, yeah, you know, yeah, yes. but what kind of God do we have? Yeah. He shows mercy to those who are the lowliest of all to give us all hope because when we discover how lowly we really are in That's fact, right. yeah. it's like, okay, now I'm ready. Yeah. You know, as you talk about this, it really pops into my mind the whole Franciscan component to this yes. whole, this whole uh, uh, teaching uh, where Francis himself uh, wanted to recreate those circumstances under which Jesus was born in the stable of Bethlehem uh, several years prior to his death. He, he recreated that in Greccio in Italy, and we continue to do that now. Uh, but it wasn't just to show, uh, this is the shepherds, these are the, the angels, the, the magi came, and J Mary and Joseph are there with Jesus. But he wanted to be able to demonstrate the circumstances, the humility, the great love that God had for us that He would choose to come into the world in this way and invite us to enter into that same mystery and to be able to then go out and proclaim that love to other people. Yeah, it is pretty astonishing. It is. I mean, the craftsman, uh, Plato speaks of the demiurge who mm -hmm. fashioned mm -hmm. the material world. That's the son, the second person, the agent, uh, the engineer, the architect of the universe. He cobbles the entire cosmos into being, and then he suffers himself to become a child, mm -hmm. a word within a word, yeah. within the world, unable to speak a word. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. It is. Uh, that, that's, that's reaching and, pretty far. And, and you actually alluded to it earlier in one of the segments about that whole humility theme yeah. of Jesus. Yeah. You see that again expressed in the crucifixion. Yeah. But each and every time we celebrate Eucharist where yeah. God comes to us yeah. under the appearance of bread. And, and that's a, and when we were on pilgrimage together in Assisi mm -hmm. and, and went to Greccio, I was just blown away. I mean, one, I knew St. Francis is the one who first developed the creche, the nativity, the place where people could come. But what I didn't realize is that in, as he made that, that scene in Greccio, mm -hmm. 
he thought, oh, can I put a doll? Can mm -hmm. I put a human child to mm -hmm. represent Jesus? And he says, no, mm -hmm. let's build an altar yeah. so that the Eucharist would be celebrated, that Christ present in Bethlehem 2,000 plus years ago is present today mm -hmm. as equal as he was back then, body, blood, soul, and divinity. In the There's universe. a beautiful balance that is struck here, I think, because on the one side, there really is concrete history. You know, you have Justin Martyr who grew up in Samaria, not far from Bethlehem, who testifies to the place mm. that is still familiar, the little cave in origin in the third century as well. So the facts of history line up. but. The reality of the mystery is sort of what St. Francis recovers. Mm -hmm. yes. I think we tend to forget that, you know, this hasn't always been around, you know, the, the, the Advent and Christmas traditions of the creche. And, and not only that, but having living characters, you know, yes. not just sculpted wooden figures, you know, but having townspeople in your own locale, yeah. you right. know, and it's precisely the way that we discover that the, the mystery of history is transferable to our own time and place where we can enter into that story and recognize he really entered into my world yes. so that I could enter into his, yeah. his life. It, it's always possible, I, I think, to sort of recapture the magic of that first night when that star, you know, shone mm -hmm. over Bethlehem. Yeah. And it is true that God, in a way, enters a world that is uh, at sword's point with God, an mm -hmm. alien universe, but not entirely so. Not just Mary and Joseph welcome Jesus, but the angels, the shepherds, the magi. Right. All of creation sort of orchestrates itself to make provision for this gift. Right. Uh, and this gift is really divine pleasure, grace itself. Even the animals sort of cooperate. I mean, it's easy and tempting to sentimentalize these quaint domestic details, but you've got a donkey, a cow, mm -hmm. you've got right, sheep, right. And, and somehow uh, they're harmonizing their sounds to make room, make space for this child, mm -hmm. the eternal yeah. child right. of God. Even the Egyptians welcome Mm -hmm. the Savior of Israel. Right. You know, sometimes I'm finished with a book and I go back and I reread it and I realize what I forgot. You know, the Magi from the East, yeah. Babylon, I was all the rest, it. the shepherds from the hillside, you know. Yeah. But I mean, the Egyptians welcome the Holy Family and we know that because the Coptic Christians who are in Egypt treasure the places where they went. I mean, you could say that that is all just invented to get tourists, but it's not. Yeah. It goes back long before there were such things as tourism, you yeah. know. Yeah. And so you recognize that, that God is reversing everything. Yeah. You know, that I always wondered how could Egyptians read the Bible and accept Jesus, mm -hmm. the King of the Jews, when you have the book of Exodus, you know, yeah. where Egypt is sort of the embodiment of all <laughs> things evil and idolatrous. And yet God shows himself capable, not only of saving the unsavable, but giving them the joy to the world in some ways before the Jews could even welcome. This is true. And you, and you look at, you, you point out how um, Joseph was the son of Jacob. You know, yes. his father's name is Jacob in the, linear, in, in the oh. genealogy, but why don't you share well, that? Well, I mean, this is, this is one under, another one of the favorite themes of the early church fathers that Pope Leo XIII picked up on, that you have, you know, the parallels between Jesus and Moses that are clear. God sends the Savior, but as soon as the Savior Moses is born, he needed to be saved because of Pharaoh's imperial decree that threatened him and all of the Hebrew male children. Just like Jesus, the Savior needed to be saved because of Herod's imperial decree. And back then he worked through a man named Joseph who's described as the son of Jacob, who's also upright, who's given <laughs> dreams, and he provides bread for the Holy Family, <laughs> where? In Egypt of all places. Mm -hmm. And likewise, you've got Saint Joseph, the son of Jacob, who is righteous, who's given dreams, and he takes the Holy Family from the house of bread to Egypt. Yeah. These parallels you know, are not accidental or coincidental. Yes. This is all part of a providential plan to show how the new is concealed in the old and the old is revealed and fulfilled by the new, but in a way that goes beyond just sort of like replaying. You know, Chesterton yeah. says, uh, what I love about God is that he tells stories and he includes uh, in the story a lot of secondary characters yeah. whom he takes pretty seriously. Right. He devotes a lot of time, a lot of pages uh, to telling their tale. Uh, in the front piece of your book, you have this yeah. wonderful passage from Pope Benedict about creation itself existing so that God could then intervene and tell the story about recreation right. so that he might effect this encounter between divinity and humanity. And so every character matters. Nobody's unimportant. That's right. He takes endless 
even infinite interest in the his only minor people characters. Who border on unimportant are the ones who are filled with a sense of right. self-importance. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And they're the, they're the bad guys yeah. Yeah. until yeah. they yeah. repent, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But I mean, what he says, I think, is so profound, Pope Benedict, that, that salvation history is not some small event on a poor planet. It's the reason why the whole universe right. exists, right. Yeah. Yeah. to make space for this encounter between God and his beloved children. Right. Creatures who are not just creatures and therefore servants, but, but rebellious slaves right. who, who are then transformed into beloved sons and daughters. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that, that's really breath catching. I mean, he gives us history so that we might somehow welcome heaven. We get nature because it anticipates grace. We get a cosmos because he wants to create a covenant within that mm -hmm. context. Yeah, and, and you share something in there, uh, although it seems minor, I think again it goes back a little bit to the Magi. Um, you, I remember this from when my pilgrimage in the Holy Land, uh, they talked about it, I believe at the church in the Nativity, where they had the image of the Magi, right? And how the Persians were coming to attack and they dis destroyed many right. other churches but didn't destroy this one. No. And, and I, again, I just think that how much this word needs to go out to those mm -hmm. magi of today, oh, out to those dark places, to those shepherds today. What you're referring to, of course, is the first wave of Muslim war yes, yes, as it yeah. took over the, the Holy Land. And they destroyed every church. I mean, they practically invented the science of archeology span because of all the excavating <laughs> that they made possible and necessary. But the fact is, I mean, it's a beautiful story that they tell to pilgrims that when they came to the Church of the Nativity, they were in awe and wonder because they didn't know the story until they saw the images and they recognized themselves because these were, these were Persians, these were men from the East, these were us, you know, yeah, and they right. were the ones who God gave the glad tidings to, you know, right. and so they spared it and it's still there and it's just a wonder to behold what more God has in store because you know, Islamic terror is not the end of the story. It might be a way he prepares and purifies us for something greater. That's and, right. you know, I, I think we still are part of a story. It is a great of mystery end. that, uh, my, you, I think you mentioned that Bethlehem is, what, about 80% Muslim at this now. moment? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, right. in, and in a way, their presence testifies to that earlier appearance That's of right. the Magi. Uh, and the Magi were somehow transformed by that event. Uh, Pope Benedict suggests that their destiny uh, included this star of grace, of hope. It's part of the journey. I mean, they were meant by design from all eternity to awaken to the movements of that star and to follow it. Right. Well, maybe their, their successors uh, could follow it. They're already there. Uh, maybe it's time to receive that metanoia. And, and sure. likewise, I would say the Christians in the Holy Land especially yeah. need our prayer and support. Yes. Yeah. Because even if there's something great that is yet to come for Muslims and other non-Christians, the Jews too, nevertheless, I think that our brothers and sisters who live in the Holy Land, yeah. you know, who the Franciscans care for sure. so well, yeah. they really do need our support. And, and when you think about, I, I just remember the, the those of us who are blessed to go to the Holy Land on pilgrimage, we, we experience something, but we also see that, that sharp contrast, that, that yeah. the world, the word is still alive there, but it is under threat. But what it's a sign of our contradiction. World. I think yeah. it goes back to what Ruiz was saying about the metanoia image that comes through in the description of the Magi. Indeed. You, you look at the Gospel and it says, they left and went back to their homeland by a different route. Right. And me and the Franciscan spirituality, I think of that as their own conversion that happens because of what happened to them along the way. And the more we reflect upon what goes on through the incarnation, through the celebration of Advent and Christmas, through our own encounters with the risen Lord, that's ultimately what has to happen. Ah, yeah. Great point. Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. So when I read Dr. Hahn's book, I really love the fact that he talked about the incarnation as the first love of uh, Christ and his humanity coming to earth and he talked about how we should not take that for granted and so for me a little takeaway was that we should really resurrect that same love back to him on a daily basis whether it's Christmas or not. Advent for me really is a time of hope. It's a time where hoping in the Lord and, and that time of the hope that speaks of renewal and new life and the fact that Jesus is coming and to rejoice in that. You know, as we look out into our world and we see trouble and stress and all kinds of problems, we can turn to this season as a time where we can know the Lord 
and come to recognize his presence in our lives and just rejoice in the fact that he's coming to us. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents in our final segment. Uh, Regis, could you start us off? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I should uh, put a plug in uh, for Scott's book. Uh, not that it's necessary. I'm sort of like a fifth wheel. I think it's going to get plenty of, uh, of uh, encouragement. It's a marvelous book. You. Uh, you've written over 40 and you're still in your 30s. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty astonishing. You defied all the laws of biology. Uh, you recount uh, events that are really marvelous, miraculous even. You know, the sudden eruption of God into time, into history. There he is on the stage of human experience. And, and you describe those events which are fabulous, but you describe them so well. Mm -hmm. And that too is a kind of marvel. In, in fact, everything you touch turns to gold. Uh, uh, all of the books you've written uh, are really wonderful testaments, uh, I think, to faith and faith-seeking understanding. And if you keep this up, turning books out like hotcakes, you may run out of syrup. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you may exceed even Andrew Greeley, uh, whose output represents a kind of gold standard, although the quality of the message is somewhat uh, suspect. You just keep writing, you know, like, like that battery that never goes dead. But you've got good material. You're writing about God, God becoming man. Never was a tale told that men would rather find true, mm -hmm. as J.R.R. Tolkien tells us. And it's a story we never come to an end of. Uh, right. uh, and uh, it's the foundation. It's the centerpiece. If you pull the plug on incarnation, everything collapses into a kind of, I don't know, monkey dust. Uh, and there's nothing to commend. We might as well go off and become used cars uh, uh, salesmen. Uh, so I have to commend you, uh, Scott, for this book. Mm -hmm. And I, I pray that it wins uh, many readers because the obvious conclusion is I need to deepen my faith mm -hmm. when I read this. This is galvanizing stuff. This makes me want to be a better man, a better Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, God bless you mm -hmm. uh, for this muse that has animated your efforts for so long. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Regis. Father Sean? I, I love what Dr. Martin was saying, because I, I just certainly have to echo about what a great gift this book is to the church, to all of us, uh, to be able to reflect upon the incarnation in our lives. And I, I particularly love how you, you weave the story together. It, it's not only just the facts and the, the circumstances that we hear from Scripture and tradition, but you weave the story of your own family in there in many places, too. And, and that really brings it alive for me to help me to, uh, you know, let my own imagination run wild, my own memories run wild of what, what all this meant yeah. to me uh, in my life today, in my time growing up as a child. Uh, thinking about all of the figures, the characters, so to speak, who are in the, the, the gospel story, the shepherds, the magi, Mary and Joseph, and of course, Christ himself. You know, I, I think when I was a young child in parochial school, um, we used to get every year in, during Advent season preparation, we used to have the great uh, responsibility of carrying those statues from storage mm -hmm. into the church to help the pastor set up for mass or for the, uh, the Christmas celebration. And, and as little kids, we used to just kind of let our imaginations run wild and think what would it have been like to be a shepherd? What it would have been like to be one of the Magi coming and worshiping our Lord? And, and I think as we prepare for Christmas during this season of Advent, we need to step back again. How am I inviting myself into this story? How is this story changing my life? And how am I changing the world because of the incarnation present to me? Wow. And I think your book allows us to be able to let our imaginations run wild to help us to unpackage that story. And, and I certainly thank you and commend you for what a wonderful job you did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Scott? Thank you. Oh. You know, I, I wrote this book not because I looked out and I saw all these people who needed it. I wrote it because of how much I discovered I needed it, you know, mm. because especially when you teach theology and you teach the Bible, you know, you can get lost in Christology and forget that Christ saves us, not Christology. Mm. That doesn't in any way diminish the importance or value of theology of anything. It enhances it, but it prevents the tail from wagging the dog, you know. And I also find out every year at Advent, how the incarnation is no longer amazing to me. 
shopping, you know, grades, all of the, and then all of a sudden I'm amazed at how unamazed I am. Mm. And, I, and, I, and I think I write so often for self-therapy, you know, <laughs> and if it blesses others, it's not surprising to me because, you know, I kind of do it for my own sake, you know. But I also do it because uh, unlike my wife, who we describe in our home as pathologically positive, <laughs> you know, when I don't pray, I become neurotically negative, you know, I become joyless. And so I find that, you know, not only do we have joy to the world in the Christmas story, but for the new evangelization, which represents the mission of the church in our generation, mm. you know, the joy of the gospel is what Pope Francis mm -hmm. promulgated. And right. all the other writings echo that theme. And I think it's important for us to recognize that we're probably not ever going to get to the point where 70 or 80 percent of Catholics can explain all the doctrines or prove it all from the Bible. But the one thing we can do is to recognize that the joy of Christ came to the world and that the joy of the gospel is that one thing that we need. So that the one thing that Catholics can do is enjoy being Catholic, mm -hmm. and especially in Advent. You know, go shopping for sure for family members and friends, but get to confession, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also read the Bible, but you can also gather the kids or the grandkids or the neighbors and just sort of relive the, the story itself. We've done that for many years, and only years later do we realize that our kids who just seem so bored and distracted really have memories that were life-changing, you know, in years to come. And so I would say, you know, enjoy being Catholic in Advent. Enjoy Christmas, you know. Enjoy being Catholic in every single Mass. But that joy is what the world is looking for. Joy to me is more effective than any proof text you can deploy from the Bible, any arguments that you might recite. Joy is what we all are looking for. Joy is what we find irresistible, more irrefutable than any arguments, you know. And it's also a reminder to me when I wake up without joy that the grace of conversion is exactly what I need. And it's yeah. exactly why Christ comes to me every morning through prayer, through the scriptures, but through family as well, mm -hmm. and all of my problems. And so opening up myself to the joy of Christmas is sort of the way I think that we're gonna get through the whole journey of life and discover you know, that, that heaven awaits us and the Holy Family itself will greet us. Amen, amen. Well, just to echo everyone else, thank you for writing this book. It is uh, extremely, extremely important for us during this time. If you've enjoyed today's topic, uh, we have a free handout for you uh, from the joy, uh, joy to the world, Silent Night, Holy Night, that's with a night with a K. Uh, on St. Joseph. On St. Joseph. It is actually, it's a really great read. It's, it's not very long, but it is so, so wonderful and a great meditation uh, for us during Advent. Um, just to kind of close with some, some minor thoughts, the church gives us this season, so we pause, that we take that break, that we sit, as Scott was saying. Um, and if you don't have a normal daily prayer time, start one right now. Let this be the beginning again. Um, if, you, if you don't know what to do in your prayer time, you can read the readings of the day or a great book like Joy to the World. Um, and, and make it more fruitful than ever before and encounter Christ in the Eucharist and the Mass. Um, thank you for watching Franciscan University Presents. Uh, our mission here at Franciscan University is to form those who are going to go out and transform the world with Christ. And I want to invite you to be a part of that mission, uh, possibly coming here and studying here on our campus in Steubenville or maybe through our online classes. Also to join us at our, our dynamic summer conferences or join us on the holy shrines and our, our, as we go on pilgrimage or at faithandreason.com for so many great resources for the new evangelization. Father, could you close us sure. with a blessing? The Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and have mercy. May he turn his countenance to you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.